Good uh, morning still. Uh, so I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to who I am and my background, not because I just want to kind of uh, tell you all about it, although to be honest I probably could, um, but uh, because I want to kind of invite uh, questions and challenges around that and kind of hopefully you'll see some of the experiences and, and things that I've done and why I talk about it. So, um, I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer, I'm extremely proud of that, I've been at for about a year, that's something which uh, inside IBM is, is quite important, um, but uh, it basically means I'm technical, <laughs> which within a technology company is quite a nice thing to get a kind of say, so that's quite cool. Um, the, uh, I've been in IBM for about 13 years, uh, most of that time um, I've worked in enterprise architecture, basically as a consultant helping people do enterprise architecture one way or another, either augmenting, working as a chief architect, whatever. So had lots of different experiences in lots of different companies. For the last few years, um, I, I've been operating as the CTO within our services division for industrial clients. So um, I started back in engineering a long, long time ago, um, a very long time ago. And um, so I tend to be involved in in organisations that make stuff, process stuff, and have got an engineering, manufacturing, kind of industrial type of feel. I've worked in other sectors as well, but that tends to be my sort of thing. So I will use some examples from there for what I want to talk about. Um, and the other part, I just want to kind of introduce, oh, so two other things I need to say because they'll cover my uh, uh, talk. One was before I joined IBM, I was Chief Enterprise Architect at Royal Mail Post Office for six and a half years. So um, uh, that was quite a while ago. I, I ran that shop. I made every mistake at least once, right? Um, and hopefully learned from some of them. And that kind of, again, informed my whole kind of world around enterprise architecture. Um, and the other part, and this feels like a confessional now, um, is I am currently the serving co-chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum. So if you want to have any pops at Togaf, have a go, that's fine. <laughs> Having in the previous session been told to move because my head was giving glare to the camera, I don't think you can insult me anymore today. <laughs> um, but seriously, happy to talk about all of those and, and anything in, in that sort of front. So, uh, this topic, I picked this topic because um, it is probably the single biggest topic that I get embroiled in uh, today. So, you know, make no apologies, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I am with a lot of uh, the kind of things that I do. I work with a lot of large organisations um, that have got very large IT instances, lots of IT going on inside of them, lots of people doing lots of change all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them have had good successes with enterprise architecture, some have had very bad experiences with enterprise architecture, and everything in between. And uh, I don't think there's a single organization that I talk to that doesn't talk about Agile, right? and the challenges that that is presenting to them. Clearly, the level of adoption, what they mean by Agile, how that kind of work varies, um, uh, but you know that kind of Okay, how does enterprise architecture and agile actually marry up? That's the kind of exam question. So, um, oh, by the way, do stop me, right? So, you know, challenge, throwing questions, if there's anything you want to ask, if you just got an experience you particularly you want to throw in, I'm very, very happy to take it on the fly. I don't have to go through presentation, it's not a story. Um, in that sense, I may even jump around a little bit because I tend to steal from my own slides from my head. So, um, so first off, uh, there's a little thing here. Uh, I'm going to use a little expression, the winter of EA. Um, now, this actually works better pr prior to the last season of Game of Thrones, right? However, it's still valid. Um, uh, and I'll sort of uh, show you something as to why what I'm thinking about it. But the, the, the question, do we need, do we really need enterprise architecture in the world of Agile? I'm not going to take a poll in this room, because I kind of sense it's probably slightly light. <laughs> but, but, maybe not, right? So, um, 
And a couple of things, uh, and you know, there's some pictures in here. So who, just quick show of hands, who is familiar with design thinking of any type? Right, okay, so yeah, about half, I'd say. So, um, and, um, uh, and so, and, and agile, agile development as well. Any kind of particular agile, any, anyone would say they were a sworn agilist? Mm, yeah, no. yeah. And so, uh, basically, if I, in these areas, what, what, in particular design thinking, what we're um, uh, tending to see, uh, and IBM has, has uh, got its own flavour of design thinking, we've added a couple of extra pieces to the way that we do it, but essentially design thinking came out of, Right. Um, and um, basically, it, you know, it, it, it puts the user at the very centre, the customer at the very centre of the experience, and sort of says, how does the experience influence what you should be doing? It leads very well into classic minimum viable product creation, right? That kind of proof of concept piece. And um, a lot of organisations are working with a very have great experiences of following some form of design thinking and doing some kind of agile development and saying, actually, um, let's build up a, 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 some proof of concept, we'll prove it out, uh, or we'll call it something different, like a prototype, because we know the concept is valid, or whatever it may be. And we'll create a minimum viable product and we'll put it out in a while, and it'll go live with it. And I'll talk a few stories, and I won't share any names, but I want to give a couple of examples of, of what's happened. So, so I know organisations that have been doing that for a couple of years, so, right? So and some of them have been doing it uh, to great success in their industries, right? So they've, they've got a lot of uh, publicity for it, they've, they've uh, created great stories behind it. Um, now, what has happened is, um, uh, more recently, certainly I've noticed this in the last year, uh, a lot of those organisations have come back and said, we have got a lot of minimum viable products that we have tried to scale and make them add up. And we've put them on top of, in a kind of coral reef way, um, on top of our systems of records, as we've done, our existing systems. And, and now we're getting to the point of, actually, how do we make these things join up? Where's the, where's the interoperability? Where's the piece of kind of coming together? That's the question that starts to appear. How do we make these things kind of uh, work together? But also, a few, and so you'll see the reason why I won't mention the names, have had problems, right? in particular security problems as a, as a good example. Um, and if I give a, 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 a story, um, I'm going to make sure, I really have to be careful about, about where I'm with, but a story, an organisation that has had some uh, cyber security issues with its estate, right? And nothing that sort of came through that I understand was a, a front page of the, of the papers type sort of issue, but enough, uh, enough problems for them to be concerned with. Um, and um, I went in uh, and actually looked at uh, what was going on uh, across the whole piece. Um, and, you know, it, I gave you my background. I am uh, somebody who, who likes a good method. Um, I like the architectural profession. Uh, I kind of, you know, uh, believe in all of that sort of goodness, I won't try and pretend I don't. Um, so I went in and had a look at what was happening from an architectural point of view in these projects. Now virtually all of these projects had come from an agile uh, approach and had delivered a lot of benefit and a lot of uh, value very quickly to the organisation. So coming back to this morning's piece about value, certainly they were kind of being seen as high value. By publicity, credibility, actual financial return. Um, however, there were some fundamental development mistakes going on where people were, you know, breaking rules or, or making uh, mistakes that crept up into the code, basically. Um, and uh, when I looked at that, one of the things that sort of um, was quite apparent is actually so the, the same mistake was getting repeated. Now, it was like, okay, fine, mistakes happen, 
But the fact that the same mistake was occurring in multiple proof of concepts and multiple you know, viable products across the piece was demonstrating that nobody was looking at it across the, across the, across the way. And nobody was learning from that mistake. Okay. Um, and then there were other parts where you kind of go, well, actually, that's a decision that should have been made that actually protected somebody from that. That was an architectural decision. And that architectural decision was made, but just wasn't made using the right framework. And I don't mean an architectural framework, I mean the kind of decision-making framework. What is good practice in that space, right? How should you configure that particular technology platform? Where should you store that particular set of credentials, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and similarly, things like, um, I think Matt mentioned it before, the DevSecOps tool chain. You know, how is that maintained and managed across all of you at the moment? Are they all following the same approach? So, quite a few sort of issues popping up once people, not because they're, when they're initially adopting Agile, they're getting some success, and there's some clash of culture, and everyone focuses on that, certainly. But definitely a problem once you've got uh, a reasonable amount of planes in the air because of having had the agile uh, approach and you're trying to put it all together. And certainly when you start to scale. So um, I mentioned architecture winters, and one of the things is, uh, uh, and there's a picture I've got which um, I've drawn. I, I, I was going to get the next one reduced a little bit more professionally, but. Um, I was told not to, right, by a few people. They kind of liked it. But essentially, what I'm talking about here is, uh, you know, I've been around in enterprise architecture now for mm, mm, 25 years. And through that time, it's certainly been through kind of, you know, highs and lows, probably different ways of putting it. Um, so I draw this picture, and forgive me, this is a kind of gross generalization. And you can see it's drawn very roughly, but it kind of tells a story, so let's bear with this a bit, and I'll kind of walk you through it. Hopefully you can kind of see it still in the photos of that. But a long, long time ago, I'm going to see if I can mess up the camera right now, but we'll get over here. I certainly, well, I started working at a little company called Lucas Aerospace in Wolverhampton, Port uh, Houses in Wolverhampton. And my first job was working on a uh, stores system. And in those days, and the reason I mention this is because the way you did that is you literally went and built a store system that the stores person used in the stores, right? And that it was an inventory management system, fine. It didn't connect to anything else other than the power socket. Okay? That was it, right? That's, that's all it's probably a little thing that Greg Farm, you know, that, that, that all. And, but we also had a procurement system, right? Guess what? The procurement system bought the parts that went into the stores but didn't connect with the inventory system, right? So we all kind of get this. Now, the point behind this, and I, you know, I could go with the finance system, and, you know, the supply, et cetera, et cetera. But, the, you know, it was one of those sort of, we look back at it now and just kind of go, oh yeah, and everyone can remember, I'm sure you can remember, you know, but the parts that were bought, actually, when somebody kind of went, well, hey, we can put these together, we can actually, uh, uh, we can get a system of 36, we can put these on the same thing, right? Um, the problem was the part numbers had come up with different naming conventions, right? So they wouldn't, he couldn't do it. They were kind of bought in different ways. One was to do with where it was located, the other one was who it was bought from. That's which way around that design, right? Um, and the point was it was disjointed, so you couldn't actually uh, marry it together. And from that, and I'm not saying it was from Lucas, I'm saying it's from that's the kind of the typified example. But it was that fact that we'd all got about building silo type solutions that enterprise architecture. And that was the concept you need to join up, right? That's essentially where it came from, right? Like if anyone disagrees with that, then I'm, I'm interested to know if it, I think it came about for a different reason, but that's where I kind of saw it. I know it's a great simplification. Right? <laughs> um, so ERP, ERP, ERP then comes along, right? And this was the biggest challenge for me in that everyone kind of went, well, I've got, I've got, you know, in this case, the, um, when I went to um, uh, Royal Mail, we had SAP, we bought SAP, everyone goes SAP, wall to wall, the, right, the, uh, the answer is SAP, now remind me what was your question again, right, kind of stuff, yeah, we all remember those days. So you 
didn't need me to come out of the box. What was the point in an enterprise architect creating a data model when there was one already in the package? Right? So I now didn't have to worry about how a part was defined because a part became predefined, right? So, so I didn't need the uh, enterprise architecture. Now that's a winter. Right? I'm not saying it was the first winter, but it was definitely a winter. However, packages, lovely. In this case, in my world, an engineering world, we have PLM packages, product lifecycle management. Uh, there are CRM packages, customer relationship management, ERP packages, etc., etc. And the point about packages is they didn't join up. Yeah? They clashed, they overlapped, they used different conventions, they used different ways of talking to each other. So, hey, there was a whole need to kind of marry those together again. Guess who we needed? Yes, we will the enterprise architects back out and said, make me join, you know, the, the chief deck wanted you to join the packages back up. And that's a lot of the work that I ended up doing uh, actually at, at Royal Mail. Um, so they didn't join up, so basically EA yeah, comes back again with all their twin spec solutions, and then some some smart aleck in Crate that comes up with ESPs and ways of creating stuff that's all universal, you don't have to worry about it, everything's gonna plug into an enterprise service bus. Hey ho, no problem, right? Yes, we remember what happened there. We got lots of them, right? So lots and lots of different ways of integrating stuff. So again, you need enterprise architecture for great You kind of get the story, the kind of the idea, kind of makes sense, right? And, and there's various winters we don't need it, we need it now. What's happened here, agile solution built on cloud, digital disruption, I've thrown in a few buzzwords just to try and make people happy. That this is where we are today, right? Um, EA is dead again, you don't need it, it's all about creativity, speed, innovation. I've got colleagues who basically are uh, very, very strong in the agile space, um, who kind of go, oh yeah, it's by the architecture, right? you're going to stop me doing something, right? You are the no shop, that's what they're, they're there for. Um, but, so, uh, it's quite a dark winter, I would say, to be honest. Um, but then we've got this situation that I've come to before, whereby creation of different points of, um, Proof of concepts, different point solutions aren't necessarily adding up, and when you start to scale them, create longer term problems. So, so that's where we are. And just to add to that, um, two other things that kind of fit in on that. We, we had a little bit about finance before. Um, excuse me. A lot of organizations that I'm working with have started to adopt agile software development processes. Um, rather than bit agile business processes. I, I don't want to kind of conflate the two. Um, some are trying the whole thing. A lot of them um, have a still load um, a traditional financing cycle. And trying to marry the two of them gets quite awkward because it basically says, well, who's the demand owner, right? Where's the demand coming from? And that's quite an important thing when you're talking about trying to understand where you're going. So, um, so how, how does see any of that being addressed? Well, first of all, I'll put in two things, right? Because whenever we started talking about Agile and EA, or EA and Agile, um, there's a bit of a difference, right? And, and both are valid, uh, both relevant. But there's, how does enterprise architecture itself become more Agile, following the spirit of it, right? So what does that actually mean? Okay. Um, because there's a part that basically says, Enterprise architecture, we've seen already kind of the models, the artifacts, and whatever else. It has a perception that what you're doing is a big design up front. Right? You are designing the whole enterprise up front, and then everyone's got to kind of follow the blueprint. Now, that's, I say that's a perception, because you should never have done that in the first place if that's what it was actually doing. Um, but, you know, it's also not viable anyway, right? So, but, it, but it is certainly a perception. Um, so there's, there's a need for enterprise architecture to demonstrate agility itself and its practices. Uh, and then the other side is how do you get um, uh, enterprise architecture, uh, the, the, how does enterprise architecture support agile projects? Okay. So it's kind of, if you think about it from an agile and agility company. And because you need a deal book in every presentation. If you've seen this one before, apologies, but it is such a deal. So, I have put in safe, right? So, uh, 
CAD discipline agile uh, discipline agile something it's got anyway it's got Ambler uh, wrote it um, along with some others but uh, and safe so uh, people familiar with safe anybody used safe. It's used in the loosest sense. In the U. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it come down to the second, what does it mean to use it? I type the token, what does it mean to use it? Yeah, yeah, no, actually, that's a fair, fair point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, what I just want to show very, very quickly then, say, so, say, a lot of organizations I know are kind of going, uh, fine, we, we are going to, we're a large organization, we're going to follow Agile, we can't just do Agile in the in the, uh, in the in only the Spotify model. We're going to use the Spotify language. People familiar with the Spotify model or not? Does that make any sense? So Spotify have got a, a thing. There's a couple of YouTubes on there that's quite uh, on the web uh, that are quite useful for people to sort of explain how they went about their um, uh, agile kind of uh, software development. And they talk about chapters, guilds, squads, tribes, all that sort of stuff. And um, it's uh, very compelling, but it also relies heavily on everyone being in the same room all the time. Right? So there's a, a lot of talk, and, and one of the interesting parts is, uh, and the reason I put this up is, SAFE is, is probably the largest Agile framework that's published. It's got a lot of people that are certified in it. Right? It's relatively prominent. It's based on Scrum, so you know, it's got all the right things on terms in there. Um, I'm not promoting it above any other, I'm just saying it's a very popular one. But it uses the term enterprise architect up here. So it identifies, so this is the leading agile framework of any scale. And it identifies that there is a place for enterprise architects in there. Um, now that's interesting to me, but, but I'm an enterprise architect, and I go, oh, right, what are you doing? Um, because uh, clearly um, it raises a lot of questions of, of how you do that, how you get it. I'll give another very practical example. Um, the and, and you'll see this sort of thing if you look on any of these sort of chat rooms or whatever. You'll see people saying the enterprise architect needs to be in the development team. They need to be in the project, right? And you, you hear people come up with that view. I can't help with that view simply because um, I've got one organisation I was talking to last week that's got 300 products going on. And they're going, well, we haven't got 300 enterprise architects by any stretch of imagination, so they're never going to be full time in every single project. Right? So, so we've instantly got a nice kind of bit of theory, but then you've got a, well, actually, in practice, that's never going to fly. Right? So, so, how do you make it? How do you actually do that in practice? Right? How do you get that person? And they're kind of going, well, if they're not in every stand up, if they're not in every ceremony, right? I mean, you know, then, it's like, yeah, okay. So, so, there needs to be some kind of coping mechanism. And then certainly if I look at this, this is the point is you can do some easy translations. So I took some stuff from the IBM uh, uh, EA method, which to be honest, if you looked at it and kind of went, it's a bit like Tokaf, you would find a lot of similarity in the work product underneath, right? Because they share it with a lot of heritage. So. Um, but the idea is you'll see things like epics and updated components mentioned in an agile project, and you can translate them to what the vision is. Network, story, uh, you know, your, your projects look like they're building blocks, look like components. So you can kind of do a bit of a translation, a bit like you could say, and a, and a true agilist will get highly offended, but you can kind of go, a stand up or a ceremony is like a meeting. Right? No, it's not a meeting. Well, it is a meeting, right? But it, it obviously it happens in a different <laughs> format, but it is still a meeting. Right? Um, um, that's really what you're Oh yeah, so, so, the, it, so as in who creates the actual uh, epic? So, so um, uh, yeah. Um, so here's another interesting one. So you, you worked in a product uh, thing. So um, one particular problem uh, that's occurring. So, so you're right. The product owners and the product team basically say, this is our backlog, this is the burn rate, let's work out what we want to prioritize, let's go for it, right? And 
Uh, I'm actually quite a fan of that. I like it. I like the way the backlog works. I like the, the fact that there's some good burn rate stuff you can go through and say, right, let's, let's continuously look at this. Of course, it means that the design is ever evolving and the decisions are made late on, which is part of the benefit. Um, but one of the consequences is features hit the top of the backlog easily and technical requirements stay right at the bottom very often. And that, so, so there's a need to kind of go, how do, you, how do you make sure the stuff that is relevant beyond the features of the product owner, actually, which is some of the interoperability type stuff. But don't you then just bundle your technical requirements and the good features and turn them in agile or you never really deliver a technical sprint which is obviously, you know, a customer sprint or a feature that's and then you should also, I guess, deal with the difficult things first, right? That's not very much about the agile So rather than dealing with features that might be easy. Um, so, 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 if I can kind of come in before you try to touch your head. So, so I, I have a problem, which is um, that my organization wants to do Agile, and it's not Agile for Dilbert, really, but they see Agile. Um, but we don't do, we use some software development, we do a lot of integration, we do a lot of um, uh, infrastructure provision, we do a lot of um, moving things around and changing configurations. Um, and all these things, if you read the Agile books, nobody talks about, well, um, I need to uh, have a bunch of dependencies on a bunch of network things, which are actually third party suppliers, and I have um, minimum contract periods, and all these things, which I need to get done and manage my dependencies, but I want to do it in an Agile way. I find that really, really hard mm -hmm. just to put that in a backlog and say, oh, it's in the backlog. Well, that's fine, it's in the backlog, but if I, and maybe I should do backlog refinement to say, if I want to do these things in the backlog, I have a tendency on this thing here, which is a six-week um, lead time. And that's dependent upon me getting my commercial folks out of bed to do a deal with somebody that's going to take three months. So, so I think that, that uh, in that, you know, um, maybe I just live, live in a different, a different world. Um, but I think that many people do live in that world, particularly when you know, the, there is quite a close relationship, and this is kind of interesting in this kind of DevOps viewpoint, there is a close relationship between our, our, our delivery people and our operational people and the people who are trying to design the new things to go through that, but it's all very clunky. It's not all software driven. It's often you know, configuration driven, um, which you know, maybe we're just not there yet. But I think that, that in the world of Ireland, for example, it's not quite as clean as you read in the Scrum books or the, the Agile literature. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that helped. That's it's a great, thank you. It's an interesting conversation. Um, and it is exactly that. It is, I, you know, I, I, hands up, I will go first person that came to me ever and said, I'm running an agile project. My spider senses went, you just don't want to write anything down and show me, right? <laughs> it's, I, I admit, that's where I was, okay? <laughs> But that's because I was a, a, a worrier and I had all the scars of people trying to do stuff without engaging with enterprise architecture, okay? And, you know, I'm a convert, right? I, I have seen some fantastic results of following a far more agile approach. However, it raises lots of questions that the whole industry is still grappling with and, I, and, and those sorts of topics, right? And, and it is difficult to kind of prescribe that there is an answer. Because everyone who's done it has managed to do it in certain, do, 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 do it in certain ways or in certain parts. Um, and I'll give an, uh, another example. There's a, there's a great assumption almost when you're doing DevOps is that uh, it kind of carries on. Right? The contracts don't carry on. Right? They stop. And um, I've got several situations whereby um, a large organization has contracted with one organization to do some development they can offer them, they can bring it to someone else because procurement thought it was cheaper, right? And they bring it to someone else, well, a, 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 a simplified situation, but that's essentially what they've done, right? And they give it to someone else, and they're doing the operation of it, and you kind of go in, where was the DevOps idea? Well, that, you know, that, you separated them out because of the commercial construct, and yet it was built in an agile way, and when it was built, you did push back some of those wider dependencies, some of the more complex stuff, like 
the global elements because you were only implementing it in one country initially or whatever it may be. So there's so, those sorts of things. And it's not about saying um, that they, they, they're not being included, but there is an element of the whole kind of how things get prioritized. And, and I can assure you, when you put product owners who are um, uh, business-led, business people, and great, we're doing that, it is very, very hard to argue and to not prioritize features, right? Very, very hard indeed to keep the technical stuff from stopping slipping down, down the scale. But the point was with the, with the, uh, the, the stacking part was this role is, um, is identified what it does. And I think if you look at the what, you, you agree and kind of go, yeah, you know, uh, the vision, the drivers, set standards, etc. What is missing is the how, right? So how do you do some of that? How do you actually bring some of that to life? So I think we all kind of agree with, with, with the others so that it, it's sitting there. Um, and um, I go back to, I do know where this one came from. <laughs> so that's all right. Um, I go back to an old picture and when well, this is what I used to do back in the day, right? And, and it's easy to kind of implement it wrong, but essentially, and I'm not going through it in detail, but you used to take what was going on in the business and the IT world, and, and we can draw maps and we draw the cells at the centre, right? So that's what I did, and of course. But um, you basically, you take what's going on, you develop some kind of work plan, and uh, use some sort of framework of modified Tonga as you're supposed to. Um, and then publish some assets and then have some kind of design authority. That was a kind of easy old fashioned way of doing it. Along came Agile and everyone kind of went, oh yeah, but that looks like a long sort of gestation period to get to where you need to be. Um, however, there were certain things that I used to use which I called coping strategies. And I've now codified them up, so these are a little bit of a, a gift, hopefully. Um, you can challenge them away, whatever, but these are the ones that, these are the five things that I think are relevant for agile and product architecture. And you might say, weren't these always true? Right? Um, you know, whatever, but for example, um, just enough enterprise, just enough architecture just in time, so don't try and create it all at once. One of the things, if you've ever been an instructor, and I think a number of you have, uh, that you find out when you're doing any kind of instruction, and it only dawned on me fairly recently, I have to admit, is when somebody says, what does one of those look like? Can you draw a picture of an architecture, let's say it's a data model or a business capability model or whatever we saw earlier. When you put those up, what you don't see is the fact that there are gaps. Right? You, don't, you don't draw voids. Okay? Um, there are things that are missing. Uh, and, and that's and it always will be. In any large enterprise, you will never get to the far corners and the whole uh, all of the setup. But just enough, just in time. I come from a manufacturing background, that's why I said just in time. Don't create it if you're not just about to use it, kind of stuff. So this is about how do you create that architecture so that you've only got pieces of it, right? Now that's not as simple as it sounds, right? It's very easy to say that, but you have to have a way of being able to have just some of it. Which means it's never finished, but it's obviously ready, right? So this is about some of it being concise and summarised, but some of it being able to just have this minimum viable like that. It's just the basic, the, the bare bones of what you need, so that you can see some of it in focus and some of it not. It means you have to have different levels of fidelity across how you define your enterprise architecture. So you will never see a picture like the ones that were shown this morning, hopefully, because it, though, that kind of gives you an impression it's all done at the same level of fidelity. Um, here's an interesting one and controversial, but Agile Enterprise Architecture needs innovation because one of the parts about uh, uh, Agile and projects is, yes, there's a certain element of innovation comes into every individual product and project, uh, or change, or from whichever you look at it, but there's some overall innovation that goes on. Now, how does that come in across the entire suite of products? Right? So you've got business innovation, but you've got a whole technology innovation. So I know plenty of places that are, rightly or wrongly, adopting enterprise architecture as the innovation hub that feed into what has to change across the suite of architectural uh, uh, products. Um, 
Up and down basically means uh, that uh, there's a business driven uh, vision, but you've also got the existing estate. You have to protect the existing estate and you have to feed up of your technical debt into the estate. So both sides of the equation are highly relevant. The last one, um, and around here is an old expression, but it's still highly, highly relevant for me, and this is the one that I always say, um, VIE. So these are my takeaways whenever I go anywhere with enterprise architecture, and, and this is so, so true in, in, in Agile. Viability, integrity, and extensibility. So as an enterprise architect, whether it's an Agile project, or a waterfall project, or Wagile, whatever the terms are, people like to say about something in between, um, you know, is it viable? Will it do what you need it to do? Not it is not assessing how it does it, just does it achieve the outcome? Is does it protect the integrity? So you've got to think about worrying about being a custodian. I saw the stewardship thing this morning. That's very very important. So will it damage your existing estate? Because if it will, don't let it in. Um, and by that I mean, you know, from a performance point of view, a security point of view, a data integrity point of view. And extensibility is because fundamentally there is still nobody else with a set of goggles on that says, well, if we just keep that door slightly open, that's important in the longer term. Right? That's still something which is relevant and still a constant fight against that nemesis called the project manager. Paul, that's, uh, you, you mentioned some really important principles there, and I think the last two are particularly interesting in terms of the stakeholders and how you engage with your organisation. So I'm interested to see the messages that you've conveyed here. Are you finding that these are resonating at the CXO level? So for example, the idea that technical debt actually results in more complexity, therefore reduces agility. So your goal of Agile is actually being compromised by, by this. And also that there are many things, going back to the earlier comment, which are not best to live in an Agile way. And actually, you need to have clear criteria when to go agile, when to go waterfall or structured. Is that being engaged at the CXO level? So, so the conversations that so there's two. I'm going to break that into two if I can. One is um, there are plenty of conversations whereby um, I've got permission for people to believe that I'm not flogging something in IBM. Okay. Right? Um, so, in, in those situations. Uh, all people that I've worked as you know, people that worked as a proxy that, that are in those organizations, two things are happening. One is, yes, people are recognizing that current constraints is a big issue. Um, and how do they unlock those constraints? Um, I mean some still just think agile will solve it like that, right? Or, or I've heard the word business platform, that must solve it, right? Whatever. But but there's a greater awareness. And on that greater awareness, one of the terms that's coming through a lot, uh, and it has surprised me, is a lot of people are coming to uh, enterprise architects that I work with in their organizations and saying, where's our business architecture? Because I need to understand what we do. Now that's not something I would have thought was going to become, but a lot of people are much more comfortable and familiar with it. So, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there because of time, that's all right. Um, so just very briefly, I wanted to put the sign bin framework up. I don't know where it's from, but I just did the picture. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically that you know you have the uh, it's, it's through flow. The point is it's about reducing the number of unknowns, right? And uh, up here in complex projects with the lots of unknown unknowns and you're trying to sort them all out, you need a different mechanism. And that's where trying to break it down and using some of the agile stuff can work very well. But it also means that you have to architect in a slightly different way. I've just suggested that's a useful kind of reference part. Just to conclude it in terms of time. I put up uh, two things in this slide that are relevant. One is I'm seeing a lot of people take enterprise architecture and take the term COE, which used to stand for Center of Excellence, and change the excellence term to enablement. But they recognize that they're an enablement center, right? They are there to support delivery and development. That's a bit of a trite term, if you like, in some ways, but it also actually incredibly powerful if you truly embrace it. And that idea of the design authority, there are only five things you need to worry about. One, has every single thing that you are doing got
got a technical leader on it, whether it's a, they call themselves a solution architect, a lead developer, an engineer, it doesn't matter. Is there somebody on point who's making the technical decisions? Right, that's the one thing I worry about. And then if they're making the technical decisions, are they capturing them? Because if they're not capturing them, I don't know they're making them. And then against what code are they uh, using? What set of standards are they using? Because even the most agile approaches are following security guidelines or good practical coding guidelines or wherever else. And so if you think about it, architecture decisions are still being made. They're being made against a set of good practices and they're being made by a person. That build should happen. Every single thing that's going on in your portfolio, that portfolio is essentially your enterprise architecture. That is where I will stop. Thank you very much, boys.